Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome to the Guilty as Charged podcast. This is Katzen's Corner, a special edi- edition of Katzen's Corner. Uh, obviously, I'm here. I'm not usually here for Katzen's Corner. So uh, we're going to have a good conversation tonight with Alex, who uh, is getting ready for uh, his trip out to the Combine. What, uh, what's on the docket next week, Alex, as you uh, make your way out to Indy? Yeah, so we'll uh, you know, be heading out for Indianapolis Tuesday uh, evening-ish, like kind of turn that into a travel day and then uh, – catching up with uh, some people that I saw out on the all-star circuit, some people that I didn't get a chance to see. I'm going to meet some new people, uh, got all kinds of uh, interview stuff planned for media availability and everything throughout the week. I'm really excited. It's my first time going to the combine. Um, I've, I've been turned on to some of the spots already by some people that have been out there before, but uh, excited to get out there and just uh, put my ear to the ground see what I can hear. <laughs> Um, cause that is when, uh, a lot of these rumors start flying. So yeah, just yeah. excited to get out there. Yeah. I, I, you gotta try the infamous, uh, shrimp cocktail. Uh, I forget the place's name, but apparently yeah, I'm thing. allergic to shrimp is the thing. Everyone. Oh, <laughs> and I'm like, All I right. can't, All right. I will watch you try it. <laughs> like, there you go. There I'll you be go. in the room. I'll get a review from someone. There you go. All right. Sounds good. Um, but yeah, you know, the combine is obviously where everything starts, starts turning out. Like there was some stuff that came out of like, uh, radio road, the Super Bowl, but you know, the combine stuff is really where we'll get a lot of, you know, real updates about everything. You know, Joe Ortiz is going to speak and I have assumed Jim Harbaugh as well. Um, and then, uh, yeah, Alex will get some, some good information. Be sure to join our discord. Alex will share some there. Um, and tonight we're going to go over Daniel and Jeremiah's uh second mock draft it kind of sent twitter ablaze so we decided to to sit down and, and have a conversation about it so um by now obviously it's been out for two days you guys have probably read about it so you know it is no new information here but we wanted to kind of dive into the things that stood up for the chargers alex has been doing draft videos on the channel for basically since like september so we wanted to have this kind of kick off like the the real draft season if you will uh first and foremost so um, all right, Alex. Let's uh, let's dive right in here to the to the nitty gritty. The Chargers in this scenario taking Joe Alt, the offensive tackle from Notre Dame, in Dan Jeremiah's first mock draft. He had them taking Romo Dunze. Um, let's start with Alt in terms of uh, you know where he ranks for you or like what stands out to, uh, about him to you from this tackle class. You know what, what's kind of your initial first look at Joe Alt, the offensive tackle. Yeah, I think he's going to end up finishing as my OT2 behind uh, Olu Fashanu. Um, I think that most people have it reversed at this point because Alt had a better season this year. Um, there's a little bit more like projecting wise um, that's out there. But for me, like the Penn State offensive line the rest of the year, and we'll talk about one of those guys probably a little bit later on here. Um but like outside of like one or two guys, like Fashano was kind of the guy for Penn State. And so they kind mm-hmm. of threw a lot at him this season, uh, which I think kind of like impacts that projection too. But I mean, with Alt, I think like the appeal is going to be just like solidifying the offensive line, right? Like yeah. he's a solid player. There's really no like glaring flaws in his game. Um, and I think that that's what's going to be appealing about him to uh, teams that do have him OT one over like a guy like Fashanu, who's maybe a little bit like maybe a little bit light as a, as a run blocker sometimes regressed as a pass blocker a little bit this year. Um, so I feel like that's where a lot of that is coming from as far as the chargers fit. I mean, you and I have talked about this a ton, both between ourselves and on Twitter and everything. Yeah. I don't love taking a guy that's only ever played left tackle and flipping him to the right side and having that be like your plan from the jump. Um, I also don't think it's a very good idea to flip Rashawn Slater after he made an all pro team at left tackle to go play right tackle, even though he's done it before. Yeah. Um, So from that standpoint, I think that it's something that needs to be explored a little bit further maybe rather than just kind of like the like jump reaction of like, Oh, I hate that. That sucks. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it does seem like it's going to be a real possibility. Right. Yeah. And so I think like you have to look at who are the other guys that have done that uh, in the past. Right. And so you look at someone like Penny Sewell, who's like regarded as one of the best tackle prospects of the last 10 years flips to the right side where he kind of, 
maybe fit better anyway because he was more of kind of like a mauler um, coming out of Oregon. That not really a data point that you can consider with Alt. I don't think he's not the yeah. same prospect. Evan Neal on the other end of the spectrum, like guy that played right tackle at Alabama, moved to left tackle for his senior season, gets drafted by the Giants, who already have Andrew Thomas. He moves to right tackle. He's struggled a ton. Um, but there have been some kind of like whispers about like his like work ethic and stuff like that coming out of New York. And so like maybe that's not a data point that you can really consider either. Yeah. And a guy like Paris Johnson, who got drafted by the Cardinals this season, played right tackle. I thought he played pretty decently well. Um, mm. all things considered for how much talent that Cardinals team had on it. But that's one year sample size. And so again, it's kind of like there's a lot of like missing data about like, is this something that is feasible to do? Yeah. Um, I think that if you are someone who trusts in the Harbaugh and Hortiz pairing, then there has to be a certain level of trusting their process, so to speak in terms of making a pick like that sure. um, because it's the first pick that they're making. And it's kind of like the statement piece. Yeah. Um, I certainly understand the compulsion to draft a like big time playmaker at that pick, uh, do all that sort of stuff. I get that. Um, I don't really think that that's how any of the teams that Jim Harbaugh or Joe Ortiz in Baltimore have really ever like operated. I don't really think that that's the way that like an offense under Harbaugh or under Greg Roman has really ever operated. It's not really the way that Baltimore has ever really operated. Um, and so that kind of like leans me away from that. Um, but it's, there's still so much time to go and there's still so much stuff yet to happen. Like it's, it's interesting at the very least. Right. And like, yeah. I think it's a good discussion point to at least talk about like, what does that look like going forward? Yeah, I think it, Real quick on like the Hortiz and Harbaugh thing. I, I think it's tough for anybody to say like this is like this is my opinion on what they're gonna do. Like neither of these gentlemen have ever picked in the top five. Like you know, the 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 highest pick that Harbaugh ever made, I, I believe was Alden Smith. And I think that was at like 10. So the Ravens were never in the top five. They were always, you know, like worst case scenario for them was always like in the mid teens. So that part I think is interesting. Like there's a lot of people who are like, I like I I just have a feeling that Jim Harbaugh and Joe Ortiz are gonna do this. And I'm like, but really, like, what's that based off of? Like Jim Harbaugh recruiting offensive linemen yeah. is not the same thing as like picking top five in the draft. So that that's a thing there. In terms of Joe Alt, like I I'm doing my best to like evaluate him properly without like not dislike letting my dislike of flipping him to the right side on the chargers affect my evaluation. But, right. you know, I, I think you have to take into consideration his background. You know, his dad played in the, in the NFL as an offensive lineman for a very long time. And what I love about Joe Alt is that like, there's, there's no bad habits. And yet there's still like all these, like there's room for him to grow because he's only played, offensive line for basically his time in college because his dad made him play tight end and quarterback and other things in high school so there's no real like bad habits there's no bad roots for him to like you know have concerns on so you you're almost getting like a blank slate in that regard because he's only had notre dame coaching which is like elite offensive line college coaching and what he'll get in the nfl so you know like like you mentioned i think if if the Chargers do switch him to the right side, I think it would probably work out better than I would think because of who he is, because of his background. That doesn't make me like it less because I like I still think it's a risky prospect to take somebody who's only played left tackle and move him to the right side. Like you mentioned, Paris Johnson had multiple snaps. I think he was a guard his first season at Ohio State. He played left tackle, right tackle. Evan Neal, same kind of thing. So it, it just like if your goal is to maximize the prospect, I question if that happens with Joe Alt at right tackle because he's so used to playing left tackle. But like I said, his background is theoretically conducive towards him being okay at right tackle too. Yeah, definitely. I think like it is a good discussion, right? About like, is that a maximum usage of the fifth overall pick versus taking mm -hmm. a guy like Odunze who Dan and Jeremiah had uh, going to the Chargers in the first mock draft that he did where it's like yeah. that is going to be a guy who 
if all works out the way that everyone thinks it's going to, is going to be a number one wide receiver in the NFL for a decade plus. Yeah. That objectively seems like a pretty good use of a top five pick, right? Yeah. Um, obviously there's all sorts of things that can happen, uh, to guys like that, um, where that doesn't end up happening. But like, that seems to be like the consensus about like, that's what he's going to be. There's enough tape. There's enough out there to say like, that's probably his 70th percentile outcome. Like not even like tippy top ceiling outcome. Yeah. Versus like putting alt at right tackle. It's like, okay, there's a lot more variance in what you get out of that outcome. Like maybe he turns into an all pro at right tackle because like you talked about his dad played in the league forever. He's got no bad habits. He's kind of just like a blank slate that you're working off of with like, a he's six, already eight got blank slate too. right. Exactly. But also like he could make that switch and you know, he's only played offensive line for three years. Essentially he's only ever played left tackle. He switches to the right side and maybe it just doesn't work. Um, and so I think that that's, Certainly a discussion that's worth having and a discussion that I think Chargers fans are going to have to continually have over the next couple of months, because this mock pick is not going to go away. (laughs) Like it's only like it's only going to pick up more steam based on like the things that I've talked to people that I know that are sort of connected to stuff like this. This is only going to continue to kind of happen. Yeah. Um, I do wonder a little bit too how much of the reported there hasn't really been reported interest, but how much of the like assumed interest, I guess, is based on Tennessee picking seventh. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because most people that I've talked to assume that like that is Joe Alt's floor is seventh overall to Tennessee. Yeah, which makes sense because Bill Callahan, I, I assume, would love a guy like Joe Alt. Right, exactly. And so if you're the Chargers and you're thinking about trading down, right, all the teams that want to trade up into the top five for a quarterback prospect, say, which Daniel Jeremiah has Jaden Daniels going sixth to the Giants, so it's Mm -hmm. the perfect spot to trade up if you're going to trade up to get to five. You have the Falcons at eight. You have the Vikings at 11. Everyone is past seventh, right, unless the Giants are going to move up one spot and do like a Mitch Trubisky trade. Yeah, And so if you're the Chargers, right, you can go to these teams that are trading up for a quarterback and say, like, hey, man, we really like Joe Alt. We're going to take, like, he's not going to be available if we trade down to eight because Tennessee is going to take him at seven. So you got to, like, send us a good offer. You got to make it worth our time because, like, we're going to miss out on a player that we really like, right? Um, And so I do think that that's maybe part of it, too. Um, obviously it's a, maybe a little bit early to be getting into smoke screen season. Like I said, a lot of this interest is it's the perfect time and not reported. Right. And so like it, it gets kind of dicey. Right. But yeah. like that is, I think something worth considering also is that whether or not this interest in Joe Alt is real from the charger side, it's a leverage play because yeah. like he's going to be gone by the time the pick that you trade down to rolls around. And so that ups the value of like what that pick is going to be for a team trading up, right? Where like, instead of getting a one, a three and a five or whatever it is that matches the, you know, the value on the chart, it's like, okay, like give us a one and a two and a four, right? To like, you know, make it worth our while a little bit more. Um, So I think that that's something like worth thinking about also, um, because I do think that ultimately this pick is for sale. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. Jeremiah didn't do trades in this mock draft, but like based on the way that he's talked about it on Twitter, based on the way that, you know, other people have talked about this pick, it certainly seems like, uh, and based on like the way that Joe Hortiz kind of operates the draft in general, um, historically in Baltimore, this pick is going to be for sale. They're going to take calls on it. Um, and if they do, I think that that makes the idea of taking a tackle, whether that's Joe Alt or someone else, more palatable like Mm -hmm. if they move down to eight or move down to 11 or something and take a guy who's they're either going to move to right tackle or they're going to take a right tackle like jc latham or uh fuaga that to me is more palatable and so it might just be a preparation of like hey we're going to take an offensive lineman it may not necessarily be here but like prepare yourself for the position fit um and so I think all of that is like worth thinking about also. 
Yeah, I think from a trade standpoint too, it's it, it's preparing for different different outcomes because if the quarterbacks go one, two, three, then you're not like you're not really going to convince somebody to trade up to five for JJ McCarthy. I would think Jim Harbaugh's trying his best, man. Jim Harbaugh, Jim Harbaugh better get up at the podium at, at the combine and say, you know what, JJ McCarthy should go number one overall again. Um, but you could also drum up trade interest for a tackle. Like, hey, everybody, we like Joe Alt. You, you all know Tennessee likes Joe Alt. Like, you better come get it if you want Joe Alt. Right. So it, it that works both ways there. Um, so you mentioned you probably have Joe Alt as OT two. In a in a vacuum, if you knew that the Chargers like were gonna take Joe Alt, which pick would you like prefer to take him at? Is that at a five? Is that at ten? Like, what's kind of your comfort level of taking Joe Alt? I would say somewhere between like ten to twelve. Okay, uh, like somewhere in there. Um, I think that like this class gets so dicey at the top because there's so many like incredible players. Um, it's a great top 10 right and so like stacking the board like that if just like a vacuum top 10 of like who are the top 10 talents in the draft it like i think that he's closer to like that 10 to 12 range and uh Fashanu is probably closer to that like six to eight ish range for me okay. um i think that taking into account like the way that the draft works you're probably comfortable with taking alt as high as like at least me personally probably as high as like eight um knowing that you're gonna move him to right tackle i think that it probably comes back down to that like 10 to 12 range yeah and so like in a vacuum if it's like this is the player that i have to pick you get to tell me like i get to tell you where to pick him i'm saying like 10 to 12 but that also again comes with the understanding of like that's probably not realistic uh right. in the actual thing um and so in that scenario then it's like like six to eight like you can you know pull my arm a little bit and i won't be like mad about it um sure. because like you know you gotta do what you gotta do um but yeah i think like in a vacuum like around like 10 to 12 um just because this class is so good at the top it's so mm -hmm. much fun mm -hmm. yeah i think we see the, the offensive tackles pretty similarly like i i can get there with joe alt at five i wouldn't like Love it, but he's not a bad player. Like I do have a pretty high first round grade on him. I do also have yeah. Olu as OT one. I think just the athletic traits and the core strength recovery. I think he's just a more fluid mover than Joe Alt is. I mean, Joe Alt is six eight. Like he's going to be a little stiff. So I am like a little concerned about that. But for me, like if the Chargers stick at five, like my priority is adding a weapon. Like I think obviously you know Malik Neighbors for me is wide receiver two. Marvin Harrison wide receiver one. Uh, I have Romo Dunze like very close with Malik Neighbors as, as wide receiver three. Like this is, in terms of your top three wide receivers, like this might be the best trio of wide receiver prospects we've seen, at, at least in my time, like studying the draft. Um, you're obviously a Washington guy. There's a lot of people out there who say like Romo Dunze doesn't belong in the same conversation as Malik Neighbors. I think that's kind of foolish in my opinion. I think he does. Uh what is your sell of Romo Dunze as a, a, a potential pick for the Chargers at number five? Yeah, I think that like your opinion on like how close neighbors and Odunze are just kind of depends on what type of receiver you like. Sure. Um, like obviously neighbors is like the big play threat uh, in kind of the modern sense, right? Where mm. it's like, this is a guy you're going to give a whole bunch of crossing routes and stuff, and he's going to turn it into a 40, 50, 60 yard gain on a 15, 20 yard throw versus Odunze is a lot more like a, not a throwback, but kind of like a mid 2000s big play threat where it's like, he's just dunking on people. That's yeah. his whole thing. <laughs> um, the comp that, that I've seen a lot that I really like is DeAndre Hopkins um, yeah. for him where, and I think that people are getting a little bit lost in the way that Washington's offense fed him the ball in the sense that okay. there's a lot of plays that don't necessarily showcase his speed as much as uh, they could have. Um, because I guarantee you next week, Romo Dunze is going to run like low to mid four fours. <laughs> and most people that I've seen 
have him as like a four five athlete. And that's just not true. <laughs> that's just not. He was true. a state champion track runner in Nevada. Right. Exactly. He's a state champion 200 meter runner in Nevada, which is a pretty decent track state. And last off season, reportedly, according to the freaks list, which he was on, by the way, um, he reportedly ran a four three four at Washington's off season training. Now that time is juiced by Washington to get it out as PR for the school. And so if you, you know, treat it like a, but you don't time. make the freaks list if it's not even like possible for him to run that. Right. That fast. Exactly. And so if you treat it like a pro day time where like the, the general pro day adjustment is about 0. 0.08 to a 40 time, you're, that's still a four, four, two. And so I think that like the way that he played didn't necessarily always convey that sort of speed. Um, yeah. And the way that Washington's offense operated didn't necessarily always convey that speed. Um, and that's a conversation that you can have about the structure of the offense. That's a conversation you can have about like Michael Penix and his very long windup to throw and very long drop back mechanics and things yeah. that kind of like force the timing to be a little bit different in that offense. Um, but I think that people just see that like, he's not as like natural of a separator as neighbors is. And they go like, Oh, well, he's not going to like, he's like a four or five guy. I don't know. Like he dunked on people. <laughs> that's cool, I guess. And I'm like, no, yeah. dude, like yeah. neighbor, like neighbors is just a different athlete. And I think people are maybe yeah. like watching them back to back and getting kind of like wrapped up in like, oh, well, he's not him. So he must so be bad. like a four or five guy. And it's like, yeah. no, like watch neighbors and then watch like two or three of these guys that are projected to go like second or third round or something, and then come back and watch a Dunze. <laughs> You're like, oh, okay, got it, yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think he'd be a phenomenal pick. I think like, especially if you're thinking about like replacing the Mike Williams archetype, which like yeah. we still don't know what they're going to do with his contract and everything. Odunze is the Mike Williams replacement. Neighbors is more of like the addition right like he's more of like the field stretcher like yak threat that like yeah. we thought we might be getting from quentin johnston but the chargers offense hasn't really had um and so like those are kind of the two things that like you know like the two archetypes that you're that you're working with here and so it's really just a matter of like what your preference is yeah that that's very well said i i, I think romo dunze is being sold short by chargers fans and and i understand why everybody likes malik neighbors like i get it like he's the the juice that he would bring to the table is is unlike anything we've seen as charge fans so i understand that but romo dunze like we don't have to sell him short to hype up malik neighbors like that's my thing here is that both guys would be your future wide receiver ones both guys would like be this great pairing with justin herbert for the next you know ideally 10 years i think they're both on that level like for me as an aside, Marvin Harrison is kind of becoming like underrated right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> but to me, like I have, like I have Harrison like very clearly like in the generational tier, and then I have both neighbors and Odunze in the blue chip tier. Like they're both great prospects, worthy of taking number five. Absolutely. It just fills different roles, you know. Like like Alex said, I think that was that was a great point there. So it, it's gonna be really interesting. For what it's worth, Daniel Jeremiah on the NFL Network podcast said that he believes the pick ultimately will come down to Joe Alt or Romo Dunze. So, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens there. You know, Malik Neighbors is, people are saying like, oh, he's like not a type of Joe Ortiz, but Joe Ortiz also drafted Zay Flowers and Marquise Hollywood Brown. Like, it's not like this yeah. is Tom Telesco, like you have to be 6'2 or, or higher. So we'll see what happens. That could also be smoke, but. Either way, I think both of those players are are fantastic. Uh, any other final thoughts on Odunze before we uh, move on to the next part here? No, he rocks. I think the Chargers fans <laughs> might have PTSD because he's 6'4". And so, yeah. <laughs> oh God, another yeah. Telesco receiver. Uh, yeah. But no, he rocks. Yeah, he's 6'4 and fast. So, you know, the, the height is there. The speed is is definitely faster than what was previous previously taken. So the part that I think is definitely on under the radar from this draft as it re relates to the Chargers is the center position here so in the in the first mock draft that dan and jeremiah did he had graham barton going graham barton's kind of a guard slash center um in this one he had jackson powers johnson graham barton and zach frazier all going so that's your three potential top centers jackson powers johnson could also play guard for what it's worth um but that's a big deal for the chargers because the chargers need a center and in this scenario, they wouldn't have the opportunity to get one until very late in the draft. So it, 
in terms of those three, is that a scenario for all three of them? Do you think all three of them could be first round players? Because, uh, you know, like everybody and their dog sends me a mock draft of Zach Frazier as pick number 37 at this point. It seems like the Asante <laughs> Samuel Jr. thing from a couple of years ago. Um, but what do you, what did you make of seeing those three in the first round? Yeah, I think that it's interesting. Obviously, uh, Jeremiah doesn't put a guy in the first round unless he's hearing that like it's possible that he'll go there, right? right? And so I definitely think that it's possible. I do think that it's interesting in the sense that like the write-up for Frazier, Jeremiah has him going to the Lions at 29, and the write-up is very centered around like Frazier is a Dan Campbell type of player. And so I do wonder a little bit there, right, of like, is this – a guy that you're putting in the first round because you think he's going to go in the first round? Or is this a guy that you're putting in the first round because he fits with this team and you're not really sure like what else they're going to do yet? And it's just like, oh, well, he seems like their kind of player. Yeah. Because there's a lot of guys like that that are borderline first rounders and you can kind of pick out a couple teams picking towards the end of the first. It's like, oh, well, that would be a good fit and that would be a pretty good fit. And then they end up, you know, if those teams pass on him, then they end up available in the second and you kind of get to the top of the second and you come back around and it's like, oh, well, actually he's a good fit for all these teams picking at the top also. Um, So in that sense, I think that I don't read like too much into it. Um, Like I certainly read less into it than like having Jackson Powers Johnson at 19 and having Graham Barton in the second or in the first rather for the second consecutive time. Um, Like those seem like they're gone. We, we can, we can stop talking about those guys as Chargers players unless they trade down like massively. Right. Um, I do think it's interesting with Frazier. Um, I do think in this scenario, like you really hope that the Chargers sign like a mid-level starter caliber guy in free agency before yeah. this happens. Um, and I know that's something that like you've talked about on Twitter a lot is like the two options basically are sign a mid-level guy like in Andre James maybe, but he might be too expensive, you know, like, but like someone like kind of in that tier and draft a guy on day three or so, or try to get one of these guys in the first two rounds and bring back a veteran like Will Clapp um, to kind of like bridge some continuity there. Um, yeah. I think if this happens, you're really hoping that one of these free agent centers that's available has decided to come to LA because <laughs> if this happens, you're not picking a center until at least the third round. Uh, and at that point you're getting pretty dicey about like, let's yeah. draft a guy who's going to start from day one in the third or fourth round Yeah, at one of the hardest mental positions in the sport. Uh, that's not great process. <laughs> and no. so, yeah, so it, it's definitely interesting. I definitely think that like center is going to be one of those needs that gets kind of pushed out to either end where it's like, it's a need for certain But, like, they're either going to take one super early or they're going to take one pretty late, I think. Like, it's not going to be something that they take, like, in the second or third, you know, like, in the third or fourth round, I guess. Yeah, in in terms of pure, like, just draft me a center, like, for the Chargers, that's ideally happening in the second round. Like, if Graham Barton or Zach Frazier fall, like, perfect. That's great. But... Like people keep on sending me mocks of Cedric Van Pran in the third round, and like that to me is, is rich. Like that that to me is yeah. is a rich of like thirty selections ish of where Van Pran should go, in my opinion. Um, the drop off after Frazier to Van Pran is is pretty big. I like Van Pran, but he's not a guy I'm like dying to go draft a pick number sixty eight or sixty nine or whenever yeah. they draft. Agreed. So. It, it, it's dicey, man. Like if you're heading into the draft with zero centers on your roster, like it's a dicey game to play because I like the day three centers, Hunter Norzad, Bo Limmer, um, Drake Nugent from Michigan. I like those players, but I don't like them enough to start them right away on this team. You know what I mean? Like they, they to me have to get like a legitimate, not top tier, but like a guy that you can feel comfortable and confident in his ability to start right away. So that to me is the second round or free agency, and they're negative forty five million dollars in in cap space. Like it's it's dicey. Like I definitely agree. Like you have to replace Corey Lindsay, but it's it, it it runs out of options pretty quick. Like we did a scenario yesterday where uh, Zach Fraser was off the board at thirty seven, and it's like okay, like 
we, we just kind of tried it to wait and then we ended up taking uh norzad in the fifth round which like i would be excited about i like norzad but he's yeah. not my starter right away no definitely not um and i think like you hit the nail on the head there like i feel the same way about van pran where it's like I would really prefer to take him in the fourth rather than the third, if those are my two options. Um, And I think that that's kind of going to bear out as the process continues. Um, Mm -hmm. And everyone else, I mean, like you mentioned most of the guys that I like, Norzad, Limmer, uh, Drake Nugent. Dylan McMahon is another one that I like from North Carolina State, but he's a little bit undersized. Um, But all those guys are going to be like fourth, fifth, sixth round picks. And like, unless it's... uh, Ola Watimi that the Seahawks drafted last year that stepped in as a starter uh, from the fifth round because he won the Remington award and just like fell because he was, <laughs> he was under drafted for sure. Then like, that's not a guy that you can start right away. And so you have to have some sort of contingency plan coming into yeah. the draft. And so I think that free agency is going to be very informative as far as like what direction they're going to go in, in that respect. Um, and I think a lot of that will have to do with like, kind of scouting the other teams around them um you know like at the back end of the first and at the top half of the second being like hey are these guys gonna take a center maybe like are they gonna do something like this scenario in jeremiah's yeah. mock draft where it's like there's not gonna be a guy for us at 37 because if so we need to take some of this budget that we're gonna carve out and give you know 10 mil guaranteed to andre james or whatever it is mm-hmm. um so i think that like over the next month or so it's going to be very informative as far as like how the chargers kind of see that, that one in particular falling out. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right, Alex, any, uh, surprises from Daniel Jeremiah here? Um, I think Darius Robinson has been a huge riser recently, but, um, I think he had him at 24 here. Any other surprises or pick that caught your, caught your attention? Not a ton really. Um, I feel like, most of these are pretty solid. I know people are going to be surprised that like Penix and Bo Nix and stuff don't sneak into the back half of the first there. I don't really think that's going to happen. Um, I guess like Ennis Rakestraw continuing to rise into like the twenties is interesting. He goes 22 to the Eagles here. He's a guy that's picked up a lot of steam since senior bowl. Um, and then Brock Bowers falling all the way at 18, I guess is notable. Yeah. <laughs> um, of like, I think that we can probably stop having the conversation about like whether or not they should draft him at five. Um, because it seems like the rest of the league is not going to value him like that. Now, of course, you get into the, the Kyle Pitts, B. John Robinson sort of like discourse zone about like, you know, there were mocks this time last year that had Bijan falling all the way to 21 to the Chargers. And yeah. I was like, oh, great. Yeah. Um, and obviously that didn't end up happening. So there's still a lot of time to go, but I think that it's at least notable that he's that far down of like, there's a potential, right? Where again, if the Chargers do trade down, which as I've said, is kind of like what I expect them to try to do. Like if they go down to 11, even like Brock Bowers might still be there and you mm-hmm. can still, and then you can kind of like have that conversation about like whether that's worth it because you've missed out on a, a neighbors or a Dunze, like a high quality, pass catcher which brock bowers also is um and so i think that that was um kind of the most notable thing um honestly like no real like super notable omissions for me i don't think i think that this is a pretty solid board um obviously there's going to be some corners and stuff that are going to be available at that 37th pick if the board falls like that which is good news for the chargers yeah um but overall pretty chalk i guess (laughs) yeah no, the Bowers stuff is it, it is feeling like copy paste from the Bijan stuff. Like everybody is like has him like in 17, 18, 19 range. And it's like, well, I wanted to take him sooner, but I couldn't find a fit. Right. Maybe that happens, but generally speaking, players like those players go in the top 12. And I still am gonna be pretty surprised if he falls past 12. I know that like that specific team at 12 probably needs a quarterback, but you know, um I like Players like him go to the top 12. Like, I just, I would be yeah. pretty surprised at this point if he's not. So, if that's the Chargers picking him at 11, perfect. I would love that scenario. Um, so, I am curious to see where he ends up going, obviously, but uh, he's so good. I, I love his tape. I think he's a fantastic player. So, um, Alex, this has been great, man. Um, would definitely encourage everybody here to check out Alex's work over the next couple of weeks, like you mentioned, uh, going out to the combine. So, Chargers Wire here on the channel. Um, 
definitely check it out. Alex, any uh, final thoughts before we head out? No, um, keep an eye out. I'll do a combine preview uh, probably for next week or something to, to go up on here. So uh, mm-hmm. keep an eye out for that and uh, keep it locked. I'm going to be reporting any news I hear. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. you know, you guys will be the first ones to see it if you're uh, if you're on the account. So uh, go over there. All right. Sounds good. We are inching closer and closer towards the draft. I think we're like a little over two months away. So pretty exciting times ahead. So um, Alex is our draft guru, if you will. So please make sure to uh, give him a follow. Check him out. Subscribe to his Patreon page if you're a real sicko. Uh, Lots of great information on there. But uh, Alex, appreciate it, man. We'll talk soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. Of course.